Here at The Shack, we'd like to give a big thanks to the sponsor of this video, my good friends at PCBWay. They'll be helping us out with our PCB fabrication needs and offer a very professional and high quality service for extremely reasonable prices. They can even populate your PCBs for you if you're tired of waving a hot iron around. There's a link to their website in the description where you can check out all of the amazing services they offer. Now, back to the show. Well, you can't spell Xmas without a MSX. And if there's anything I've learned about my viewers over the past year, it's A, you love MSX machines. The video I did back in April had over 21,000 views and over 580 comments. A lot of love for these machines. And also B, you lot love a can you build a brand new machine video. So what better way to celebrate this Christmas than with a build of the open source Omega MSX2 project, the brainchild of Sergei Kizilev. There's a link to his GitHub page for the project in the video description, and it's a belter. The project is a full implementation of the MSX2 standard and has two cartridge slots, joystick ports, 512K of RAM, expandable to four meg, battery backup and full compatibility with all MSX2 and most MSX1 software. The project is in two parts, the main board which holds all of the main MSX2 components and this keyboard PCB which allows us to have Cherry MX keyboard switches for a really nice feel. To complete the project there's a rather substantial bill of materials and this has taken a long time to get together, what with the shortages of some new components and the need for some chips from an original MSX2 machine. PCBWay helped me out with the PCBs of course and a fantastic job they did too, especially in this fabulous red, they look amazing. But PCBWay also helped out in another way which will really make this project pop, more details on that as we go on. So without any further ado, let's get on with the build. First things first, we need to ensure that we have all of the parts we need and this meant cross-referencing the bill of materials with the huge box of components from various sources over the past seven months and then labelling individual components with their location on the boards according to the bomb. I'm hoping this will mean I can just pick up a bag of components, test them and then put all of them on the board in one go before moving on to another bag. Simples, hopefully. I'll be testing component values with this multi-tester and we've also got this TL866 programmer on hand if we need one. Once I've got all the bags labelled, the bill of materials ready for cross-referencing, the GitHub page open for reference too, and all of the tools at my fingertips, it's time to dive in, starting with those components lowest to the board, the resistors. The first bag of resistors should go in R11 to R14 on the board and should be 10k in value, but just for peace of mind, we're gonna test what's in the bag on our component tester. We'll pop the leads on the legs, press the start button, the tester does its thing and tells us that these are in fact 10k resistors. So in they go. The PCB is really clearly marked. So good in fact that you don't really need to refer to the bomb or the instructions too much if you've done your preparation properly and sorted your components beforehand. We'll put all of the same value components in at the same time, splaying the legs slightly to keep them in and then whiz round and solder them in place. By default, the board configuration and BOM are assuming an NTSC configuration and there are some component changes required to support a PAL setup. The resistor at R9 needs to be 16K instead of 20K and the capacitor at C91 should be 18PF rather than 27PF. I'll put these bags aside for now as I have those replacements in another bag and we don't want to solder the wrong ones in by mistake. And that's the first batch of resistors on the board. Lovely. I'm not gonna show you every single solder joint in this build or subject you to a lengthy time lapse. We'll just get on with it and pause when we get to something interesting, okay? Now, before we pick another of these many, many bags, we'll sort out these jumpers at J5 and J6, which are part of the NTSC stroke PAL configuration. In fact, the board says not to use jumpers and to use wire links instead. So let's do that. The reasoning behind using wire links here is so that you don't accidentally change these configurations further down the line. Remember, there are actual component changes required to support NTSC and PAL output. So in the whole build, you're making that choice up front.
Okay, while we're on the subject of setting this up as a PAL machine, let's do the other component changes while we're here, so we don't forget later on. The first of these is at C91, which if you recall, needs to be not one of these 27PF caps, but instead one of these at 18PF. So let's get that in place. In fact, while we're at it, we may as well settle down for the long haul on this one because every IC has a protective capacitor in place to shield it from incoming noise and to reduce the noise it outputs to other ICs. And there's a lot of ICs on this board. So at this point all of the capacitors are in place, I've gotten through a load of bags and it's time for a cup of tea and a slice of cake. So for our next session we're on to the diodes, crystals and these resistor packs. Up until now our resistors and capacitors have had no polarity but with these packs we have to make sure we align them properly. Pin 1 can be identified by the little circle on the left hand side of the writing and we need to make sure that the pack is oriented so that pin 1 goes into the square hole on the board as that's always used to identify pin 1 or the positive lead in the case of other components. Packs like this can be a little tricky to hold in place while you're soldering so my go to is good old sticky tape, just stick them down while you do the fiddly bits. Now while we're popping the rest of these resistor packs in, let's talk about the chips I've acquired. I managed to grab a job lot of chips from an eBay seller in the States, apparently enough to complete this Omega MSX2 build. So there will be two things to consider when we get to that part. Firstly, I can't guarantee that all of the chips will work and when I received the package a lot of the logic chips were alternate versions to those specified in the bomb, which may or may not cause an issue. Let's keep our fingers crossed. And with integrated circuits in mind, it's time to put all of the sockets on the board ready to accept those aforementioned chips. And there are a lot of them. And that means a big old soldering session. More tea and cake beforehand, I think. Now you've heard me say this many times but it's worth repeating, the notch in the socket lines up with the notch on the chip and also with this notch on the PCB silk screen. Believe me it's easy to put one of these in the wrong way round and it's a nightmare to put it right later. This board is really nicely designed with all of the ICs being oriented with pin 1 and therefore the notch to either the left or the bottom, a useful touch. A bit of sticky tape to hold the socket in place while we solder it in and here's a really useful tip when you're soldering anything of this nature. You may be tempted to start at one edge and solder each pin in turn, but if you've got the socket misaligned or not sitting fully flush with the PCB, you've left yourself with a lot to undo. I always suggest soldering only two opposite corner pins, then check everything is sitting flush. If not, you only have to heat one pin at a time while you apply pressure to the socket to get it sitting nicely. Then you can whiz down all the other pins when you're happy. It's worth taking your time here to make sure all of the sockets are flush and perfectly aligned as it will make inserting and removing chips that much easier and safer for the board and the chips themselves with no uneven pressure on solder joints. And that's especially important when it comes to custom chips like this Yamaha VDP9958 video chip, which just isn't manufactured anymore. Now this Amiga build can use either this 9958 chip 
or alternatively the earlier 9938 chip, but we do have to tell the board which one we've put in, because there are differences in the pinout of the chips, and therefore changes in which pins receive power. There are two positions on the board that we need to configure for this, and we've put headers in both of those so we can select the chip type with a jumper. That way we can easily change the chip and the board configuration without any trouble if we need to. The only mildly annoying bit with this part of the build was that I ordered the wrong size DIP32 chip for here. Dole. A minute or so with some clippers soon sorted that out. A mere hour or so later and all of the sockets are in place ready to accept their lovely chips and the board is starting to take shape. While I was here I popped in these two crystals and made sure they were flush to the board also. There is a further crystal but fitting that is a little different so let's go through that in a bit more detail. This is the crystal used to drive the real-time clock at a frequency of 32,768 kHz and it does that by vibrating inside this cylindrical case. Fixing the cylinder to a higher mass object like the PCB reduces the effect of external vibration and just allows the crystal to vibrate inside its can. That's why you often see these type of crystals held down in this way. It's a mechanical solution, not an electrical one. At least that's what I've read online. To be honest, I've seen them fitted with and without the bar, so I'm presuming it's usually the PCB designer that makes the choice rather than it being a dependency of the component. For any experts out there, please put some details in the comments. And now we're on to the bigger capacitors, which are all nice and chunky and easy to handle. These capacitors have a polarity, and you can determine that in two ways. Normally there's a stripe on the casing that points to the negative leg, and also the positive leg is usually longer. With new caps, you can go by the leg length, desoldered caps use the casing marks. Again on this PCB everything is very clearly marked, but it's worth double checking each one twice as you install it to avoid any shall we say unpleasantness when we first power on. In fact, the same goes for every component when soldering projects like this. It's very much worth the extra few seconds on each component to make sure it's in the right place, the right way round, and that it's properly fixed at the point you're installing it. It will save you a lot of time later looking for misplaced parts or cold solder joints. And with all of those capacitors installed, there's only the external points to solder in. RGB, composite, audio out, power, joystick ports, printer port, cartridge slots, etc. For all of these, there's only one way they can be fitted. It's just a lot of soldering. So, as if by magic, pow, done. And doesn't that look really nice? So that's where we'll leave it for this episode, as I'm going to be enjoying the festivities, but part two will be up next week, where we'll test all of the chips and populate the board put the keyboard together and then see if it works. All being well, the final part of this series will be up straight after New Year's when we'll be putting all of this into a brand new 80s MSX inspired case. It's beautiful and you don't want to miss that. I hope you've enjoyed the video, if so please like and subscribe to the channel and hit the bell for notifications of new content. Please leave your comments below as we read every single one of them. And all that's left to say is have a great holiday break and until next time in the shack. It's goodbye from me.